Good morning, church. Good to see you. How's everybody doing? How many are doing good? Raise your hand. How many of you need prayer? Raise your hand. Can't be both. I mean, if you're doing good, you don't need prayer, but always. Okay. Hey, we're going to talk about vision. We're going to talk about a view from the rock. As a church, what do we see? Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there's no prophetic revelation or understanding, people cast off restraint. But one of the things you're seeing during these times is that people that don't have a lock on Jesus and understand the lock that he has on them cast off restraint and do whatever they want. These are nutty times. My question is, how do we disciple leaders that transform culture? How do we not go into cocoon that you, know, that you call, you know, self, uh, what's it called? Self, no, self-preservation, but what do they call it? Shelter in place. How do you... How do you not live with a mindset that says, I've got to wait for something to happen to execute the vision of Jesus in this time? How do we live like that? The first words of Jesus were, follow me. The last words of Jesus were, go into all the world. The gospel and the vision of the gospel is, how do you and I live in between those two commandments to follow him and to go in all the world? How do we live? How do we love God with all of our heart? How do we love our neighbors? How do we love people in the midst of absolutely crazy and diabolical times, unprecedented times? I mean, times where if you look at all the mental health indicators, people are not doing good. If you look at addictions, addictions are up. When you look at fear and anxiety, they're up. Depression is up. You start seeing this thing. And once again, it's not, it's not you know, just here. It's just not in this state. It's not just in our country. It's, it's a global, literal thing that's going on. And so then it begs the question, how does Jesus want us to live? I mean, do we, do we corner in fear and just, you know, come quickly, Lord Jesus? And there's a lot of people that, you know, think like that. We, Jesus, just come back. Well, I want to give you just a a biblical news flash. He's not coming back until the ends of the earth have been reached with his gospel. I'll take it. The only vision I really care about is what is the vision Jesus sees. I'm not asking you to borrow a vision. We're not going to give you uh, four, five, six, seven weeks on vision just for you to adopt something that the church believes in. I want you to get accustomed to seeing what Jesus sees for you and your life and the world that you live in. I'm not looking for a bootlegged vision, a secondhand vision, a vision somebody else I should see through. I've done that. I've done a lot of stupid things in my life. I will tell you a big stupid thing. In the ninth grade, a friend of mine wore contacts, and we were bored. And I had a great idea. Hey, man, let me try your contacts. And he said, okay. And this is back where there was only one kind of contact, hard lenses. So he popped them out, and I popped them in. And I couldn't see a thing. And my eyes started to swell. (laughs) And they got really big. And they got really irritated. And I'm telling you, it took 25 minutes to get those hard lenses out of my eyes. Why? Because I was never meant to look through a lens of someone else. And the only lens you're called to look through is the lens of Jesus. The lens of, lens of scripture. What does he see? Not does what the rock of Roseville see. Not, not does the church down the road see. What does Jesus see for your life in the world? That's what I want to lock onto. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. This is an intro. This is today's message, just a little intro. Starts out with a warm and fuzzy. Verse 14. Jesus rebukes their unbelief and hard heart. He's raised from the dead. Jesus has raised from the dead. His suffering is over. The cross is over. You would think he would be in a pretty good mood. (laughs) And he comes 
to some disciples, his disciples that didn't believe the report of the ladies who said they saw the empty tomb and he's not there, he's alive, and they didn't believe it. And Jesus' first words to them, I rebuke you. (laughs) Wow. He rebukes their unbelief and their hard heart. And he said to them, and once again, this is in the same sentence. This is what's, to me, it's so amazing. He rebukes their unbelief and hard heart, and he said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. What's he saying? Go everywhere and tell them that there is a new kingdom and there is a new king. And he's a king who loves He's a king who died. He's a king who sacrificed for humanity and preached this gospel, this good news. The good news of that, the fact that you can be saved, that you can be restored, that you can be healed, that you can be delivered from addictions, that you can go from an empty, purposeless, hedonistic life and live one that pleases God and that has the life of God indwelling on the inside of you. That's an amazing vision. That's an amazing purpose. That's an incredible thing. In fact, let me just ask you this. You know, when when you look at scripture, it just seems it's normative for Jesus to go around and do good things. Do you agree with that? It's normative for him to heal people. Do you see that? And deliver people from demonic oppression and addictions and to give hope where there's brokenness and restoration. You see that, and I want to ask you a question. I want you to be honest. How many of you have seen some of those things that Jesus has done in your life personally? Let me just see your hands. If you've experienced some of what I just mentioned. Okay, let me ask you a question. If that Jesus is good enough for you, is he not good enough for the whole world? So much for my personal relationship with Jesus. It's our personal relationship with Jesus unto the ends of the earth. But he rebukes them. And that's absolutely amazing because it sounds serious. Wouldn't you agree Jesus rebukes you? That's a pretty serious deal. It's pretty pretty intense. It's also pretty fascinating. And what I think is fascinating, and here's where there's a lot of grace. He does it sharply. He does it swiftly, he does it righteously, he does it truthfully, but he doesn't belabor his point. If you ever ever think that when Jesus corrects you or disciplines you, that it's this ongoing day after day, oh, he's pounding me again for what I did, you're wrong. Jesus is not like your nagging mother. Hallelujah. Or your nagging mother-in-law. We'll leave that one alone. It's short and it's swift. And you know what You know what the prescription for unbelief and a hard heart is? It's a mission to go. I love that he doesn't say, okay, boys, you know what? I need to rebuke your unbelief and your hard heart, and so you need to free, read a few books, and you need to sign up for a few healing seminars. And you need to go do this, and you need to go do that. And then when you get your act together, then we'll talk about mission. No. It's decisive, it's intentional, and the healing happens after the obedience to go. Just saying. (laughs) I'm happy. (laughs) Jesus invites and challenges us to go deeper into his heart for the world. Verse 16. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned, and these signs will follow those who believe. Now, he's telling his disciples that. In my name, they're going to cast out demons. They're going to speak in new languages, new tongues. They're going to take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it's not going to hurt them, and they'll lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That's a little different vision than, well, you better go to church. You better listen. You better just listen. Listen. You better take good notes. You better have a good attendance record at church. It's never what it's been all about. Never. It's about those things right there. Because vision is participatory. It always has been. It always will be. 
In fact, I, I read a couple different, through a couple different sources this week that since this COVID thing started and churches started going online, one out of three people that have been watching online services around our country have stopped. And people were discouraged. You know, these demographers were, were discouraged. And they were, you know, how, how do we get them to keep turning? The point has never been how much and how long can you watch a sermon. That's a horrible theology. Jesus didn't say that. Now, there is a learning and there is a watching. But we're not, at the end of the day, we're not called to be spectators of Jesus. We're called to be participators with Jesus. And anything else is a sad religion, in my humble opinion. You're going against your spiritual DNA if you're a spectator. How you doing? Watched another great sermon today. I watched two church service onlines. Irrelevant. I'm not saying you can't get something good. I'm not saying don't take notes. I'm saying, yeah, take it in, digest it. But it's always been hearing and doing the word of God that brings life. Hearing only, James said, brings deception. As my mom used to say, choose your poison. She was weird. So then my question is, these few words that Jesus spoke, how did the disciples do with what he said to do? Right? I mean, so I want to know what's the evidence, what's the fruit? If Jesus said this, I want to know the aftermath. I want to know the rest of the story. And here's the rest of the story, some of the rest of the story. He said to go, and they went. And these disciples took the gospel to Armenia, France, Spain, Greece, India, Egypt, and North Africa. These guys, they took it, and then they were all killed for it. Vision will cost you. The vision of Jesus, the price will be paid. You will pay a price. It will be uncomfortable. It will rub you raw at times. It will cause restlessness and uneasiness. But it will always be fruitful, his words done his way. Verse 19, after the Lord spoke to them, he was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. And I love this. Some of my favorite words in scripture. And they went out. Obedience. Give them a thumbs up. Look to heaven. Thumbs up, guys. They went out. Preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. They didn't preach a dead letter. They preached the words of the living Christ, the words of the resurrected Jesus Christ. And he went, he was working with them and he confer, confirmed his words. Jesus' vision is participatory and we're invited into the very life of Jesus. He's given to us great, exceeding, precious promises so that we might become partakers of the divine nature. You and I are invited into the divine life of Jesus. It's incredible. It's powerful. You can't match it with anything. And if we're partakers of the divine nature, then it assumes that we're participants with the activities of God. Let me close with these verses right here. Luke 9, verse 46. Once again, because there's a myth out there that goes something like this. Well, you have to be speci specially and specifically designated. You have to have a special calling. You have a, to have a unique calling. You've got to have some position. You've got to have some title. You've got to have some credentials to do the things that God wants you to do. And I will tell you, that is not true. He has a few callings for some specific things he wants done, but the net is wide. The engagement is wide to whoever, whoever will obey. And I love this. This Luke from chapter 9, verse 46. Here's the disciples. An argument started among the disciples as to which one of them would be the greatest. 
Let me just tell you, that's a dumb dialogue right there. You're following Jesus. You got rebuked. <laughs> you know, you've not always done things right. And they're arguing who's the greatest. You know what's absolutely funny about that? They're arguing who's the greatest when if you back up seven or eight verses, you see they get called out for not having any spiritual game. A guy comes to, comes to Jesus and says, my son, my only son, is vexed with demons. He's possessed. He foams at the mouth. He shakes. I can't control him. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cast him out. Jesus said, bring him here. And Jesus sets him free. And to me, the absolute audacity of talking about how great you are when you get called out and you're spiritually impotent seven verses early. That is absolutely amazing. I will tell you, I find a lot of comfort in the carnality of the disciples. I look at that and I go, if there's hope for them, I know there's got to be hope for me. <laughs> Who's the greatest? Why is it so offensive? Because it's a fool's game. You can't win that game. As soon as you and I start to tout some, anything spiritual, anything, you know, like, well, oh, I just want you to know, I read the New Testament last week. That's a good thing. Telling everybody about it, not a good thing. Pastors telling people how big their church is. Who's the greatest? Oh, our budget's this. Come on, who's the greatest? Oh, you know, Lord's had me fasting once a week for the last year. Who's the greatest? You can play that game, and I could go on for an hour of how that subtle game gets played in well-intentioned Christians' lives. Who's the greatest? Well, I did this. Oh, I've been to 23 countries. Who's the greatest? Next time somebody starts going off on how, you know, that whole thing, just say, come on, who's the greatest? You are. Come on. You know you are. Oh, is it just me? <laughs> oh, man. Jesus will, will share his nature, his love, his power, but he will never share his glory, ever. See, this is called discipleship downsizing. They were supersizing themselves, and Jesus is having none of it. Verse 49, Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop them. See, they're still playing who's the greatest. <laughs> that, little, that little board game, who's the greatest. And they missed the whole clue of Jesus' compassionate and interactive heart for the whole world. We saw someone casting out demons in your name, in your name. And we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. The audacity of that. We tried to stop him. You know what I love about this someone that was casting out demons in Jesus' name? We don't know who he is. He's never named. Here's my thought. It's just my thought. When you and I get to heaven and we stand amongst mass redeemed humanity, the people who did the most for God, you will have never known their name. Why? Because Jesus loves anonymity. Well, how, how can you prove that? Well, absolutely. What did he say in the Beatitudes? Sermon on the Mount. So when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. When you give, give in secret and be careful that you don't do righteous acts to be seen. What's he saying? Be anonymous. Do my stuff anonymously. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted and will be left, lifted up, just not now. I love this guy. He's not looking for permission. He's not looking for a committee to approve. He hasn't gone through a membership class. Nobody knows him. They don't even know his name. No titles, no credentials, but he does it. You want to know what discipleship is? 
Let's just bring it down to grassroots level. This is discipleship. Stay close to Jesus. Number two, take risks for Jesus. Number three, do what Jesus did. Number four, enjoy the rejection along the way. <laughs> this guy's doing what Jesus does, and he's getting rejected by Jesus' chosen disciples. Sometimes it's not the world that's persecuting the church. It's some sheep in the church. Sheep bite. Sometimes. Not all the time. See, they, don't, they still don't get it. They think it's hierarchy. Jesus is thinking kingdom. They're thinking exclusivity. Jesus is thinking inclusion and expansion. They're looking for disqualifications. Jesus is looking for humble risk takers. What does Jesus say? Who has the last word? Jesus. Don't stop him. Whoever's not against you is for you. Love it. Another rebuke from Jesus. Don't stop him. To me, this just shows how wide, how deep, the active compassion of Jesus is dispelling the myth that there are only a few chosen. I want to pray. You know, one of, one of the effects of five months being here is that I have been so longing to get out of the country and get back on mission out there. And so, my friend in Pakistan, who's watching right now, Hayasif, he called me last Sunday and said, Pakistan's open. 12 hours later, I called my travel guy, got the airline ticket for Wednesday. This is where I need your prayer. So I have ticket to go leave Wednesday to go to Pakistan. I had to get a COVID test a special one, a different one, um, and then I have to have the results, negative results, within 72 hours of the flight. So Friday, um, I did that life-changing experience where they stick a Q-tip that long up to the nether regions of your, whatever that is there, whatever that makes a grown man cry, that's where they went. Not once, wait, there's more, twice because you have two nostrils. Wow. And I looked at the lady. I said, you made me cry, <laughs> like for real. She goes, I'm sorry. Tip your head back. Now we're going for the throat. <clears throat> you got to get it. Anyways, just pray. Just pray, because I need negative results. Oh, that's a you're done, Bob. Um, I need a negative result to get on the plane. So would you pray for me, but I want to pray for you, that you um, engage vision, engage the words of Jesus. I mean, once again, I, it's amazing how few verses that when you pour over them and meditate on them and pray over them, it's just amazing the awakening that happens in the heart. So I want to encourage you, if, you, if you're kind of flat, you know, you're, you're, you're a little languid right now, you're kind of just kind of going, wow. You know, just not, not feeling it. I want to encourage you. Grab some pa passages where Jesus is speaking and slowly go through them. So I'm going to pray for you and us. Pastor Mark, you're going to come up. And Preston, would you, would you come up here um, and, and, and just lay hands on, on me? And, but first I want to pray for us. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray every person hears these words. And God, um, our church is not trying to superimpose on them some new thing. Uh, we're inviting people to engage with the very vision and heart and passion of God as Jesus sees it. So I pray in the name of Jesus that you would awaken every single person here that came today. I applaud them. I thank you, God, that they came here today. I pray that they were challenged. I pray they were invited in. They were, they were graced by your presence. And God, give us eyes to see what you see in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Preston, if you would just pray for me in church. If you just stretch out your hands towards me, that would be awesome.
reminded of the beginning of the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. Jesus, thank you that Pastor Bob and Asif and Seraphine and the rest of the Pakapasi, the team in Pakistan, they walk in the authority and the power and the love of Jesus. God, would you prepare the way for them? Every person they come in contact with, even as he goes through security, goes through check-in in the airports and all the screening process, give him favor to make it to Pakistan and make it back from Pakistan. And God, we pray for hope and for healing and for breakthrough in every life that they meet. God, as they distribute food, as they pray for the sick, as there's yeah. so many sick and impoverished people there, um, bring breakthrough in Jesus' name. Jesus, thank you that it's in the power of your name, not in our power or Bob's power. Yeah. So we thank you for your kingdom to come and your will to be done in every moment that they are witnessing and loving on people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.